It's time to think about the Bible like you never have before. This is Christian Questions. After the podcast, check out everything ChristianQuestions.com has to offer. Also see our weekly video series releases at ChristianQuestions.com slash YouTube. Here's your hosts, Rick and Jonathan. Pablo Picasso once said, the meaning of life is to find your gift. The purpose of life is to give it away. I'm Rick, and this is not your typical Christian commentary as we look at Bible-related topics from a different perspective. And joining me as always is Jonathan, my co-host, for more than two decades. This podcast centers on godly principles, family values, and honest dialogue in a politically free zone. So, Jonathan, what is our topic for today's episode? Well, Rick, our question is, how do we keep Jesus at the center of Christmas? And our theme text is found in Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Okay, how do we keep Jesus at the center of Christmas? So coming up in today's podcast, did you ever stop to think what Joseph would have thought when he found out Mary was pregnant? (laughs) We're going to talk about that in about 15 minutes. And how about the shepherds? These were a bunch of guys out in the fields tending their sheep when all of a sudden, bam, an angel and a life-changing message from heaven. Find out what this tells us in about 30 minutes. What would it take to bring fulfillment to your life, and are you working toward that end? Listen in to see how one particular old man found what he had waited for his whole life in about 45 minutes. And you know, we always say the most important thing about Christmas is Jesus. What practical and profound things can we learn from those who surrounded his birth? Good question. We're going to start this journey in a moment. But first, let's get some perspective. Christmas has changed. While the holiday has always had many non-Christian aspects, it seems as though the Christ-based pieces of the tradition are ever fading. In its place, we have Santa, reindeer, trees, gifts, lights, ornaments, food, family, and for this year, we also have social distancing. Now, most of the things are not bad, with the notable exception of social distancing. In fact, (laughs) they do tend to bring a cheerful sense to our lives. Putting Christ in Christmas is about much more than good cheer. It's about a message of glad tidings, of great joy, and it's for all people. How do we get back to focusing on bringing joy to the world instead of just a moment of emotional excitement. Rick, most of us love to be given gifts, especially if they carry deep meaning. Let's look at Christmas this year with two things in mind. First, and most obvious, Jesus is the greatest gift of all. Without him, life would be fleeting and sorrowful. Second, because Jesus came and ransomed the world, we who follow him are blessed with other specific and meaningful gifts relating to the gospel message. So, Jonathan, what we're going to do today is we're going to focus on these other specific and meaningful gifts that relate to the gospel message, and we're going to find them through the experiences of those around Jesus' birth. So there are four specific gifts that we want to touch on today. What's the first specific gift? Well, being chosen to do God's will in a unique way, and our example is Mary, Jesus' mother. Okay, we're going to look at Mary, Jesus' mother, as an example of being chosen to do God's will in a unique way. Did you ever wonder how Mary was able to not only accept the unlikely proclamation by the angel Gabriel, but how she could live with all the baggage that was inevitably going to come with it? After all, what Mary was told was impossible. I mean, think about this. Think about experiencing impossibility. The prospect of being faced with something so contrary to reason that it resides beyond even your imagination. Mary Mary was faced with such a reality. We're going to look at Luke chapter 1, verses 26 through 37, and we'll break it into pieces. Now in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city called Nazareth to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph 
of the descendants of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And coming in, he said to her, Greetings, favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was very perplexed at this statement and kept pondering what kind of salutation this was. I mean, look, let's face it, it's not every day you're visited by an angel. Okay. <laughs> That's for sure. <laughs> and and, and sure. saying greeting favored one. I mean, wait a minute, what's happening here? So now here, the angel Gabriel was reappearing, actually, six months after Elizabeth, Mary's cousin, conceived a son who would be John the Baptist. But this time, this appearance of Gabriel was very, very opposite. Elizabeth was married and beyond childbearing years. Mary, on the other hand, was only engaged and she was young. Gabriel had spoken to Elizabeth's husband, Zacharias, with the first announcement six months before, but here Gabriel spoke to the young bride-to-be. His greeting was one of great favor, and yet Mary's reaction was confused, and, and she, she's, she's afraid. Well, think of the question that would have flashed before her mind. An angel of God is speaking to me? Hmm. For what reason? What has happened that there is such favor and blessing upon me? See, you got to put yourself, she's a young woman, and it's like, what is this angel talking to me for? Me of all people, I have, I, I'm a nothing. You know, th- th- this is something that we got to look at and get your, get your head around. So let's hear what the angel says. The angel continues, and again, we're in Luke chapter 1, we're at verse 30. Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom will have no end. Well, first, before we get into the questions that go into Mary's head, the angel uses her name. Don't be afraid, Mary. So, you know, it's like, okay, you've got the right person. You know, that's, you know, this is not a mistaken visit. <laughs> You're talking to me. I got yeah, it. <laughs> yeah, okay. But now the questions would, would probably go into hyperdrive in her head, and you already kind of intimated toward them. I'm going to have a son named Jesus, and he's going to be called the Son of the Most High, and he will be the Deliverer, and he'll be a king? His reign will be everlasting? I mean, these are all the things that Gabriel just said. Mary had no basis in the reality of her life to be able to process this. This was beyond her comprehension of what life would would, would be like. It was a natural impossibility that she was being spoken to. Well, for Mary, faith might perceive many parts of these proclamations, but there is one question she could not fathom, and that's found in Luke chapter 1, verse 34. Mary said to the angel, how can this be since I am a virgin? You know, and you, you, you get a sense of the practicality versus the spirituality of what's going on here. Mary has no warning of this coming to her, no, no expectation. And to hear this, she is a God-honoring, law, Jewish law-abiding individual. And it's like, wait, how can this be? I have never been with a man. I'm a virgin. How can this possibly be? Gabriel has an answer. We continue in verse 35. The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. And for that reason, the Holy Child shall be called the Son of God. And behold, even your relative Elizabeth has also conceived a son in her old age. And she, who was called barren, is now in her sixth month, for nothing will be impossible with God. Rick, do you think she thought of the promised Messiah that was prophesied in Israel? Wasn't there, isn't there a verse that says, uh, and they were in expectation yeah. of him? You know, it could be. It could very well be. It's hard to say. We don't see it here, but they were. All men were in expectation. And so, as we were talking before we got, got into the podcast, so it would have been talked about in the synagogues, perhaps. Uh, I would think. And it would have been... On, on the consciousness of, of everyone else. And, and so, you know, along with this answer, the angel also tells her, your cousin Elizabeth has conceived a son in her old age. So he's giving her a sense of reality 
to be able to hold on to. And I think that's a really important part of this whole thing. So this mighty messenger from God did have a tremendous answer. It was unexpected, it was out of the ordinary, and it was impossible from a physical perspective. But Gabriel's last words must have rung true in the deepest recesses of Mary's young heart. He said, for nothing will be impossible with God. Her response to this was one for the ages, Luke one thirty eight, And Mary said, Behold, the bondservant of the Lord, may be done to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. So Mary is essentially saying, okay, this is physically impossible, but I'm here. God, I will do whatever it is you would have me to do. This is beyond my understanding, but I will do whatever it is you would have me to do. You know, we we said that this was a gift of being chosen to do God's will in a unique way. Well, this is pretty unique. <laughs> it doesn't get more unique yeah, than this. <laughs> it really, really. So, so now let's take that gift that Mary was given and let's look at ourselves. How do we respond to that which is impossible? Are we listening or are we doubting? Yeah, see, we have to ask ourselves, what am I doing? How am I responding to this? John 14, 1 and 2 is going to help us begin to see the impossibility of our own lives. Do not let your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you. For I go to prepare a place for you. See, Jonathan, that's impossible. That's physically impossible. No human, Absolutely. No human being has the, has, the, has the ability to go to heaven, and yet Jesus says, I'm preparing a place for you. How does that happen? See, we can say, well, Mary. <laughs> Mary was a singular chosen individual to carry out a singular chosen work. Well, what about us? What about our status? Let's look at 1 Peter 2, 9 to 10. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, so that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. For you once were not a people, but now you are the people of God. You had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Okay, you were not a people, but you are a people. You're a chosen race, a priesthood, a holy nation, all of this. That's not possible. Not physically, but spiritually it is. Do we doubt? Well, and that's the thing. Are we doubting this? Are we saying, wow, this is an incredible gift to be called to serve God in such a unique way? Can we, look, we can say, well, well, Mary had the direct influence of God working through her. What do we have? (laughs) Funny you should ask. Here's the answer. John 14, 16 to 17. And this is in the Weymouth translation. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to be forever with you, the spirit of truth. That spirit the world cannot receive because it does not see it or know it. You know it because it remains by your side and is in you. So that spirit is in you. How is that possible? Because that never happened before Jesus. God's power and influence working in our bodies? Given the gift of serving God in a unique way. Mary was given that gift. And folks, as true Christians, so are we. So let, let's wrap up this gift of this uniqueness, receiving the gift of being chosen. Let, let's sum up Mary and then, and then go on to ourselves. Mary was chosen by God to be the mother of Jesus, not because she had any social standing or wealth or influence. She was chosen because she had a heart for God and an unquenchable desire to serve him. We, too, must also realize that our gift of being chosen is because God sees something in us that is not necessarily evident on the outside. What do we need to do? Let us embrace his choosing and serve him with our heart, our mind, our soul, and our strength. It's a unique gift that we're given, just like Mary was given. Mary's experience makes us really think about the life-altering opportunity we're given— Let's say thank you. Once we humbly accept the gift of being chosen by God, what are we supposed to do with it? <laughs> One of the most profound aspects of serving God through Christ is the process that, gives, that God gives us to be successful in using the gifts he gives. The followers of Jesus are chosen, and that is a gift of grace. 
Those who follow are then commissioned into service, and that is also a gift of grace. So to be called is a gift of grace, but then to be commissioned to serve is another gift of great grace. It's a hard gift, but a gift nevertheless. And this brings us to our second very specific gift that we want to look at and, 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 and understand in the context of the birth of Jesus and then in the context of our own lives. What is it? The responsibility of caring for the things of God. Our example, Joseph, Jesus's earthly father. Okay, the responsibility of caring for the things of God. Joseph was given an incredible responsibility in very difficult circumstances. To take care of and, and protect his son. Yes. God's son. How, how do you do that? Yeah, yeah I know, really. <laughs> a lot of prayer and, uh, and, and, and a lot of humility. That's how you do that. So, so as we begin to unfold this, we're going to just play the first verse from, from Come Thou Long Expected Jesus. This is from our friends, the Skit Guys. And um, as we go through this, we're going to you know, just get the sense of the, the, the importance of that, like you said, that expectation that was in place before all of this was happening. You see, the necessary events surrounding the birth of Jesus would continue to present gifts that were disguised as challenges— Joseph would be deeply tested by what God would require of him. You know, let us find our rest in the born a child and yet a king. Talking about bringing his kingdom, it just, it is, there's a thrill with the expectation. And at the time Jesus was born, there was great expectation amongst men. Now, Joseph, Joseph would face a mountain of disgrace and doubt. Here you have this incredible expectation. What is he facing? <laughs> a mountain of disgrace and doubt that only extreme trust in God could overcome. Through this, he would learn the gift of responsibility for the things of God. So let's look at the account of Joseph and what he had to deal with. Matthew 1, verses 18 through 20. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child by the Holy Spirit. And Joseph, her husband, being a righteous man, and not wanting to disgrace her, planned to send her away secretly. But when he had considered this, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child who has been conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. Okay, so you have a very strong statement here and a dream given to Joseph. Now, but think about, think about the thinking of Joseph the man. The dilemma Joseph faced would have been untenable for a devout and upstanding Jewish man of that time because the covenant of marriage was in those days truly sacred. 
Now, Jonathan, unfortunately, it's not so sacred anymore for some reason. No, it's not. It's it, sad. It is. It's, it's, it's tragic. But in those days, it was truly sacred. Mary's story, quote unquote, air quotes, okay? Mary's story of being miraculously pregnant seemed a far-fetched tale spun in desperation by a young woman who was searching for a way out of some deep kind of trouble. Every logical thought of Joseph was bent toward what he thought was the hard but inevitable solution. He was he had concluded I'm going to have to 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 separate from her. I'm going to have to not marry her because this is out of order. But the angel in his dream continued. She will bear a son and you shall call his name Jesus for he will save his people from their sins. Now all this took place to fulfill what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall be with child and shall bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which translated means God with us. So Joseph has in his mind he's going to need to, to, to put her away, and he wants to do it privately. But in this dream, the, the previous verses said, don't be afraid to take Mary as your wife. And now we have these verses that give some of the reasoning behind it. And Gabriel the angel is speaking to him in his, in his dream. Responsibility for the things of God will come to us, but accepting it requires us to step up in faith. Gabriel engaged Joseph's faith through the quoting of prophecy. Responsibility for the things of God also requires us to step out of our comfort and imperfect human ways to apply it. You know, this is trust. It is. And, and the, the important thing here is Joseph had to trust beyond his physical being. He had to trust beyond what he physically knew because this was miraculous. And he was called upon to trust in something that, that would inevitably bring all kinds of kickback and all kinds of judgment and all kinds of things. But that was the responsibility for the things of God. It takes a special man to be able to do this. Okay? And trust, trust is not easy. It feels dangerous and it feels vulnerable. Once Joseph's faith was focused... He can now be prepared to walk the pathway of trust that would be laid before his feet. You know, often with a pathway like that, Jonathan, there are, you don't know too many steps. You know the next step or two, but then you don't know what's next. And that's that's it. scary. It is, and that's exactly the way it would be for Joseph. Walking this path would make him look foolish and immature to his peers. Joseph, though, was willing to absorb these consequences in order to do the will of God. Being responsible for the things of God, this is a gift, often brings unsettled circumstances and persecution to our lives. But in our hearts, there will be blessing and there will be peace. Matthew 1, 24 and 25, what happens to Joseph now? And Joseph awoke from his sleep and did as the angel of the Lord commanded him and took Mary as his wife, but kept her a virgin until she gave birth to a son and he called his name Jesus. So he takes her as his wife, and he thoroughly, completely, utterly respects her and the will of God. That's an incredible testimony to this man, Joseph. And it was a confirmation what Mary tried to tell him, yes. where he couldn't get his wrap his head around it. This was a confirmation. Everything that she told me, I know is accurate and exactly, true. Exactly, exactly. And this was but the beginning of Joseph's responsibility for the things of God. He would, as Jesus was a very young child, he would be called upon three more times to protect Mary and the child Jesus by way of three more angelic visits and dreams that would direct him to act in very specific ways. Joseph, each time, would trust these clear instructions and thereby preserve the lives of Mary and Jesus. So the will of God for the salvation of the human race could be fulfilled. See, Joseph grew into and faithfully executed his role of responsibility for the young Messiah, and thereby he was blessed. Jonathan, he had the responsibility for caring of the th for the things of God, and that was no easy task. Well, that brings us to the question, how do we respond to the gift of responsibility for the things of God? Are our hands and hearts willing, or are we finding excuses and doubting? See, Joseph could have found excuses. 
Joseph could have doubted, but he chose to follow God's providence. See, Joseph had scripture to guide him, and it's, it's very powerful that the angel Gabriel gave him prophecy. And he said, this is what's happening. It gave him a touchstone to hold on to and say, okay, this is real. I know this. I understand this. I've heard this before. He had scriptures to guide him in specific, to his specific responsibilities. Well, interestingly enough, so do we. Let's look at Romans, <laughs> Romans 12, 5 through 8. So we, who are many, are one body in Christ and individually members one of another. Since we have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, each of us is to exercise them accordingly, if prophecy, according to the proportion of his faith, if service, in his serving, or he who teaches, in his teaching, or he who exhorts, in his exhortation, he who gives with liberality, he who leads with diligence, he who shows mercy with cheerfulness. So we're told what to do, just like Joseph was told what to do. We have the scriptures to say, use the things God has given you in his service and do those things well and with enthusiasm and with passion and, and with, 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 with grace so that you can bring glory to God. Well, let's look at Joseph again. Joseph's responsibilities were to those who were chosen vessels of God. Huh, you know what? So are ours. Let's look at 1 Corinthians 12, 25 to 26. So that there may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. And if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. If one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. You know, so it's a sober responsibility to care for other chosen vessels of God, to enter into their experiences and to feel their pain and their suffering with them, to encourage them, to be part of their lives. We're told what to do, just like Joseph was, except what we're told is written for us. And it's, it's a powerful, powerful guidance. Joseph's faith was defined by his works. So is Ours. James 2, 15 to 17. If a brother or sister is without clothing and in need of daily food, and one of you says to them, Go in peace, be warmed and be filled, and yet you do not give them what is necessary for their body, what use is that? Even so, faith, if it has no works, is dead, being by itself. Well, Rick, our last two episodes, we talked about faith and works and actually how they work together. And those are episodes 1155 and 1156. And the point here is that there's something we must do with our faith. We are given the responsibility, uh, the gift of responsibility for the things of God. We need to use that responsibility. It's a sober responsibility, and Jonathan, we were talking about it before the podcast. It's kind of scary sometimes. Oh, it is. It is. But if you're given it, that means God knows that you can handle whatever portion he's giving you. So what do we do with that? Let's be active in that. So, so let's look at this. Receiving the gift of responsibility for the things of God. What about Joseph? To be responsible hardly seems like a gift, and yet it is a gift of major proportions. Joseph had the unique and difficult privilege of protecting and nurturing the Messiah. You cannot underestimate how difficult and how much pressure that would have brought him. We also have the unique responsibility of protecting and nurturing the prospective body of Christ. As with Joseph, such an important responsibility shows God's trust in our ability. And Jonathan, that's a powerful thought. God trusts our ability through Christ in us. That's humbling. <laughs> it is. And it just gives us a sense of there's something much bigger that we're a part of. What a gift. What a scary, <laughs> scary, <laughs> humbling gift. To be responsible for the things of God means God trusts those things to us. That is an unmerited gift. Being chosen and being responsible are sober gifts. What about a gift that is built upon sheer joy? Ah, God's gifts to us are all meant to bring us closer to Him. The seriousness of some of these is there to help us recognize the depth of His character and plan. Built upon these realizations are the gifts that feed our emotions. These gifts also bring us closer to God, 
but they use joy and praise to do it. So now we're going to look at a different kind of gift. The first gift was being chosen to do God's will in a unique way and had a lot to do with impossibility. The second gift we looked at is being responsible for the things of God, and that's just plain scary. Well, what's our third specific gift? The ability to see God's plan unfold and rejoice in it. And our example, the shepherds. Okay, we're going to take a look at the shepherds. Sometimes, when there is a world-changing event in God's plan, there are those who get to observe and participate by virtue of being in the right place at the right time. The humble shepherds who were out tending their sheep that night in Bethlehem were given this distinct, incredible, wonderful gift. Let's look at Luke chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. Now in those days a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that a census be taken of all the inhabited earth, and everyone was on his way to register for the census, each to his own city. Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the city of Nazareth, to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and family of David, in order to register along with Mary, who was engaged to him and was with child. While they were there, the days were completed for her to give birth, and she gave birth to her firstborn son, and she wrapped him in clothes and laid him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. So here we have the birth of the Messiah. Now we want to go to the the second verse of Come Thou Long Expected Jesus from our friends the Skit Guys. Uh, And and Jonathan, there's not a lot of words in in this verse. It's really, Come Thou Long Expected Jesus, the joy of every heart. Those words just get repeated. And that's it. Okay. Yeah. But see, we're going to play this now because Jesus is born. Feel the excitement. Feel the rush of glory that is happening. And just let the music take you there. And then we're going to come back and take a look at the shepherds. See, here he is born in a manger, and yet he is the joy of every heart. They just don't know it yet. So being born in a manger, the birth of Jesus began as a very private event. Only Joseph was there with Mary in a stable full of animals. Here we have the Savior of the world born, and seemingly, seemingly, no one knew about it. I imagine for Joseph and Mary, this would have been preferred, as neither one of them were the type to seek attention. God, however, designed for the word to get out in a most unorthodox way. Luke chapter 2, verse 8. In the same region, there were some shepherds staying out in the fields and keeping watch over their flock by night. Okay, you've got the stage set. Of course, we all know what's going to happen. But hope was about to be revealed, and that would bring rejoicing. Now, when you think about being able to truly rejoice in something— It seems evident that those who are sincere, who work hard and have relatively simple lives, would be the best able to embrace rejoicing. 
The shepherds who were given this opportunity to rejoice in the longed-for hope of the Messiah's birth were this hard-working type. God chose them to hear, to see, to rejoice, and to spread the good news. There's something special, Jonathan, about the simplicity of their lives. It's true, Rick. And if someone has everything they would ever want, and something takes place, it's a fad, it's done, and it's over. Now they're looking for the next. Yeah, impress me now. Exactly. Yeah, and and the shepherds were exactly the opposite. And it's interesting, Joseph and Mary were just like that. They were simple, they were humble. Elizabeth and Zacharias were simple, and they were humble. And you have this, this, this characteristic that flows through all of these individuals. Well, these shepherds are nameless, and yet simple and humble and chosen of God to bear an incredible, incredible message. Luke 2, 9 through 15. And an angel of the Lord suddenly stood before them, and the glory of the Lord showed round about them, and they were terribly frightened. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy, which will be for all the people. For today, in the city of David, there has been born for you a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And in that little message, you have this angel of the Lord terrifies them because who's expecting this bright angel of God in the middle of the night? Nobody. (laughs) And not only do you see this bright thing happening, but it's this powerful voice. And the voice says, don't be afraid. Angels spend a lot of time saying, don't be afraid. They do because they're (laughs) unexpected. (laughs) Right. And they're powerful. They're overwhelming in their spiritual power. Good news of great joy for all people. The Savior is born today. Already the message is overwhelming. An angel, a glorious appearance, and a prophecy fulfilled. Let's continue with Luke chapter 2, verses 12 to 14. This will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in clothes and lying in a manger. And suddenly there appeared with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among men with whom he is pleased. Singing in the heavens, praising God in a way that had never been seen before. What a privilege to see. What a privilege to hear. And there you are just tending your sheep with that humble expectation of life, And yet you have this glorious thing happening before you. What happens? What do they do? Well, Luke chapter 2, verse 15. When the angels had gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds began saying to one another, Let us go straight to Bethlehem then and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. See, these shepherds were simple and joyfully responding to this message for the hope that they had seen was powerful it was of divine origin, and it was sure. They were given a gift of such magnitude that they had to witness it in person. Let's go see what they said is happening. Let's go ourselves. Luke two sixteen through 20. So they came in a hurry and found their way to Mary and Joseph and the baby as he lay in the manger. When they had seen this, they made known the statement which had been told them about this child. And all who heard it wondered at the things which were told them by the shepherds. So they didn't keep quiet. And Jonathan, when you think of shepherds, you don't think of guys that are just out there talking to everybody, right? No, they're pretty quiet, laying around, <laughs> doing nothing. <laughs> well, uh, they're, they're doing their protective work. They, they do a lot of talking to their sheep. But you, oh, don't, okay. you, you don't imagine that they do a lot of talking to everybody else. But here, they're saying, you're not going to believe what we just saw. You're not going to believe what's happening here. This is an amazing thing. This is a godly thing. The shepherds courageously deliver the good news that they had seen, for their rejoicing could not be contained. They could not keep it within them. Here's the effect it has. Luke 2, 19 and 20. But Mary treasured all these things, pondering them in her heart. The shepherds went back glorifying and praising God for all that they had heard and seen, just as had been told them. So they, they ran to get there, they, they, they look, they see, they observe, they worship, and then they go back, and on their way back, they're praising God, because now they saw the confirmation 
of what the angel had told them. These lowly men were given a glimpse of God's glorious plan, and their simple response was to let everybody know. True rejoicing brings praise to God. So look at the shepherds, their lowly estate, and their ability to embrace rejoicing. And we got to ask ourselves a question. Go ahead. And think about Mary and Joseph. They, they received a confirmation saying, okay. Yeah, true. God had an angel appear to both of us, and now it's confirmed by someone outside of us that this truly is everything that God told us it was. Yeah, and I think that's why it says that Mary pondered that, these things in her heart, because where did these guys come from? How did they know? And when they exactly. tell them, the angels told us, it's like, okay, this is becoming familiar now. You know, we're, we're in the right place at the right time doing the right things. Well, how do we respond to the gift of the ability to see God's plan unfold and rejoice in it? Are our hearts open to this paradigm shift, or do we seek to stifle it because it makes us vulnerable? You know, sometimes rejoicing makes you vulnerable because people can look at you a little bit weird. And how are we doing with the ability to see God's plan unfold and rejoice in it? We, like the shepherds, we are in the right place at the right time. Matthew 13, 16 to 17. But blessed are your eyes because they see, and your ears because they hear. For truly I say to you that many prophets and righteous men desired to see what you see and did not see it, and to hear what you hear and did not hear it. So this is really, Jesus is is saying in Matthew 13, you are blessed, your eyes are blessed, your ears are blessed, and I'm going to expand on that, and your heart is blessed and your mind is blessed because you're seeing the gospel in front of you, how are we rejoicing in that? That's a gift. That is an unmerited gift. We, like the shepherds, have an opportunity to have our rejoicing in what we know change our lives and the lives around us. Philippians chapter 4, verses 4 through 7. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice Let your gentle spirit be known to all men. The Lord is near. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. There's so much in those verses. That's a whole podcast right there. But it it starts with rejoicing. It has prayer and supplication and thanksgiving and the peace of God and our hearts and minds being guarded. It puts it all together. We have the gift of the ability to see God's plan unfold and rejoice in it. How are we doing? Are we rejoicing the way the shepherds rejoiced? So, let's, let, let's wrap this up. Receiving the gift of the ability to see God's plan unfold and rejoice in it. To be given insight into God's plan and to truly rejoice in it is a rare opportunity. The shepherds did not expect it, but when it came, they poured themselves into it. That's a great way to describe it. They poured themselves into this opportunity. We also can pour ourselves out in our rejoicing over God's plan. Let us see it every day and live our gratitude by rejoicing in the message of the plan. Good news of great joy, which shall be to all people. That's what we have to rejoice over. The mere thought of knowing what the mind of God has in store for all humanity makes rejoicing a necessity. Where do the gifts of being chosen, being responsible, and rejoicing lead? What is their conclusion? The three gifts we've examined thus far all contribute to us becoming more worthy servants of God's plan and better footstep followers of Jesus. The end result of all of this is to walk through our lives in a new and living way. Our final gift is an expression of a life so lived. So we have the gift of being chosen to do God's will in a unique way. We have the gift of being responsible for the things of God. We have the gift of the ability to see God's plan unfold and rejoice in it. What's our fourth specific gift? The gift of a fulfilled life. Our example, Simeon the prophet. 
this, Jonathan, I love this story. I just, it is, to me, it is one of the awe-inspiring moments in the New Testament. There are many, okay? This is one of them. Most everyone wants to live a life that gives them a sense of fulfillment. God's grace is such that he gives those who follow in Jesus' footsteps this opportunity in a grand way. The example of Simeon the prophet shows us the peace that a God-centered fulfillment brings. Everybody wants fulfillment. Here's the peace that a God-centered fulfillment brings. Luke chapter 2, verses 21 to 35, we'll break it in pieces. And when eight days had passed before his circumcision, his name was then called Jesus, the name given by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. And when the days for their purification were completed, they brought him up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord and to offer a sacrifice according to what was said in the law of the Lord. Okay, so they're going up for the circumcision on the eighth day since his birth. Okay, and what this does, this reminds us that Mary, Joseph, and yes, Jesus are given no special entitlement or, or dispensation they are simply given opportunity to obediently show their faith. They were fulfilling the requirements of the law like they were supposed to. And, and Jonathan, they just go about their business because they're humble that way. We can see they sought fulfillment in the simplicity of following the law that God had centuries before given to Israel. They were just, to them, that's what life was about, was fulfilling those responsibilities. So they're there. They're, they're there for the circumcision, and here's what begins to unfold. We're in Luke chapter 2, verses 25 and 26. And there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and this man was righteous and devout, looking for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. Okay, so he had God's Spirit working with him. Now, this is different than the indwelling of the Spirit afterwards, but that's a different story. But he was focused on godly thinking and godly actions. Here was a man who had not forgotten hope, who had not allowed doubt or fear to rule his heart. Rather, he lived in anticipation and expectation of God's gift. Because Simeon was old, and this was a time of expectation in Israel, he was attentive and obedient to the Spirit's leading. Now, it's like, wait, did he have to be old to be attentive? And the reason I said it that way <laughs> is because age tends to mellow and focus you. And I think having been in the way of trying to fulfill God's will for his entire life really gave him a strong, strong focus that he would not have had. It was a, it was a very mature focus he would not have had as a younger man. So now let's go back and see what happens. Luke chapter 2, verses 27 through 29. And he came in the spirit into the temple. And when the parents brought in the child Jesus to carry out for him the custom of the law, then he took him into his arms and blessed God and said, Now, Lord, you are releasing your bondservant to depart in peace according to your word. So he's, he's really saying, my life has been fulfilled. This encounter was the most important thing Simeon looked forward to in his entire life life. He was granted a glimpse, just a glimpse of God's gift of redemption. And it's in the form of a baby. He sees the baby. He takes this baby in his arms, and he knows that his life is now fulfilled. And he's, and he's thinking, for in my arms, I hold the hope of the world. I mean, Jonathan, put yourself in that position. You're however, maybe he's 80, who knows? And for his entire life, He's looked for the consolation of God. And here it is. And it's an eight-day-old baby. And he his, knows. His life is fulfilled. That's right. He knows salvation comes through this baby. And I'm holding God's salvation in my arms. I mean, man, talk about a way to, to bring your life to a, to a pinnacle. What a gift. It is. It is. <laughs> the, 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 the gift of a fulfilled life life. Again, back to Luke chapter 2, uh, verses 30 to 33. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the presence of all peoples, 
a light of revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people, Israel. And his father and mother were amazed at the things which were being said about him. Okay, so again, you have Joseph and Mary there amazed. See, you can see that they pay attention to everything. And, and they're just absorbing. They absorb what the shepherds said and did. They're absorbing what Simeon is doing, and they're, they're realizing things. Now, Simeon realized the full import of redemption. He says, I have seen, and he's speaking to God. He's praying out loud. I have seen your salvation with my own eyes. He is a light. Your salvation is a light, Jesus, that even reaches to all Gentiles. There's prophecy here. He is a light that is the glory of Israel. This light is now just a baby, but this baby is the hope of the world. This baby will eventually fulfill the lives of every human being. Simeon continues in verse 34. And Simeon blessed them and said to the mother Mary, Behold, this child is appointed for the fall and rise of many in Israel and for a sign to be opposed. And a sword will pierce even your own soul to the end that thoughts from many hearts may be revealed. So you have this glorious moment, and then, and then he says that, and you say, wait a minute, a sword will pierce your own heart, your own soul? You know, it's like, well, why is he saying that? Because Simeon also knows that fulfilling the plan of God is going to bring great sacrifice, sometimes heartbreaking sacrifice. It doesn't make the glory of God's plan any less. It actually makes it of greater value. And he's looking and seeing the comprehensiveness of what is going to happen as a result of Jesus coming. And he, his life is now fulfilled. So, Jonathan, let's, let's, let's put a bow on this part, this, this part of Simeon's story. Well, how do we respond to the gift of a fulfilled life? Are we working, are we willing to work for it, to watch, listen, and wait for it? Or are we impatient and maybe even skeptical? So Simeon showed us patience through a lifetime, a long lifetime of waiting, of serving while he, and you know, he didn't just wait and say, you know, I'm sure God will tell me at the right moment, so I'll just go about my business. God's business was his business. Amen. And that's the waiting. So the waiting is not being idle. It's using the time, investing the time in the meantime in the service of God in the best way you possibly can. It's a beautiful thought about responding to a gift of a fulfilled life. And this is why seeing Jesus fulfilled Simeon's life so, so fully, because his heart and his mind were just so ready for God's gift. We, like Simeon, live in a time of expectation. I mean, how many people, especially with what's going on in the year 2020, have said, wow, this must be the time of the end? <laughs> right? <Good point. laughs> okay, we live in a time of expectation. We're privileged to know and see things that were not always understandable. God's plan has unfolded for us in ways that it was not understandable, especially like through times like the Dark Ages and so forth. The fulfillment of our privilege and our calling is unfolding right before us. Do you realize that the prophets saw to know, sought to know and see what we know and see? Let's read that in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 10 to 13. As to this salvation, the prophets who prophesied of the grace that would come to you made careful searches and inquiries, seeking to know what person or time the Spirit of Christ within them was indicated as he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the glories to follow. So think about the fact that the prophets searched and tried to understand beyond what they were able to understand. The prophet's own fulfillment came, according to 1 Peter, it came in knowing that they were serving a larger picture than the context of their own lives. And, you know, it goes, this scripture goes on in 1 Peter chapter, uh, chapter 1, and it's going to tell us that even the angels wanted to look into these things. And this is found in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses, uh, verse 12. It was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves, but you, in these things which now have been announced to you through those who preach the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things into which angels long to look. So it says that the prophets knew they were serving something bigger. And, and folks, if you're a, a, a true Christian following after Christ and you've got God's Spirit working within you, 
It's saying that they were serving you. I mean, think about that. Think about a fulfilled life. What a privilege. <laughs> it's amazing. It's amazing. And Simeon is such a great picture of that. So, and the angels long to look into these things. It's just, and here we are. We're a part of these things. We have every evidence for a fulfilled life. You see, we are of all humanity in all the ages past. We are most privileged. Let us focus that privilege and realize just how much we have to live, uh, have to fulfill our lives with. We've got so much. And verse 13 of 1 Peter 1 really wraps this up for us. Therefore, prepare your minds for action. Keep sober in spirit. Fix your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Prepare for action. So, Jonathan, wrap up receiving the gift of a fulfilled life. To be given insight into God's eternal plans, to be called to follow the Savior of all humanity, to be blessed with the opportunity to share the gospel, this truly is fulfilled living. How are we doing with our living in a fulfilled way? Am I living the fulfilled life according to the responsibilities and privileges and, and opportunities that I've been given? I should be asking myself that question every day. We want to go to another, another short piece from the skit guys, and this is called Remember. And it's very appropriate because it's about the birth of Jesus and the things that we need to remember. Christmas isn't just a time to decorate your house, to spend time with loved ones, and to open long-awaited presents. Christmas is a time to remember. To remember that salvation doesn't come from within. It comes from above. To remember that infinitely better than the magic of Christmas is the miracle of Emmanuel. To remember that God was not and is not untouched by the pain and suffering of this world. To remember that Jesus isn't just part of the Christmas story, but Christmas is part of the Jesus story. To remember that there is no grace without a cross and no cross without a manger. To remember that Jesus doesn't just want us to remember what he did, but to join him in what he is doing. So this year, let the lights remind you of the light of the world who came into darkness for us. Let the gifts remind you of the greatest gift of all. And this year, make your heart like Bethlehem and receive the King. Remember, you know, it's, it's, it's phenomenal when you think about the fact that God, even in his heavenly realm when he sent Jesus, did not forget the suffering of the world, and he sends his son. And all of these things, folks, that we see and we celebrate, quote-unquote, should help us to remember the greater gift, the bigger gift, the, the gift that gives us all life, not only now if we're, we're following after Jesus, but the world later, forever and ever and ever. Remember the most important things. Jonathan, as we wrap this up, you know, there's a lot that we don't know about the early life of Jesus. And, you know, we, we touched on just tiny things today. But one thing we do know is this. The event of his humble birth was enough to teach his followers simple and powerful lessons through the gift a simple yet powerful gifts. There were gifts. We only touched on four specific gifts today. So Jonathan, let's just quickly review them as we wrap up. First, being chosen to do God's will in a unique way, and Mary was our example. And in a unique way and an impossible way, and yet we have that same opportunity as well. Secondly, the responsibility of caring for the things of God, and Joseph was that example. And what a sober responsibility he had of caring for Mary and for Jesus, the Messiah. And what a sober responsibility we have of caring for the body of Christ for one another. Thirdly, the ability to see God's plan unfold and rejoice in it and the shepherds we looked at. Am I rejoicing with that same passion that the shepherds rejoiced in when they saw God's plan unfolding? And fourth, the gift of a fulfilled life with Simeon. And how fulfilled 
am I living? Am I living fulfilled according to the opportunities and blessings that were given to me? And Jonathan, all of this just scratches the surface. And uh, Luke 2, 14 reads, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. And folks, really, that's what this is about today. Our whole thought pattern today is the simple gifts that we can see in the people around the birth of Jesus to show us the gifts that we've been giving. What am I doing with the gifts that I've been given? How am I changing my life? How am I appreciating and rejoicing in those humbling and sometimes scary responsibilities? And how am I living to fulfill what God has given me? Folks, as we are in the season where we celebrate the birth of Jesus, let us remember the power of Jesus' life, his death, and his resurrection. Take the gifts given and use them. Think about it. Folks, we really do want to hear from you. Give us your feedback or send us your questions on this episode and other episodes at ChristianQuestions.com. Also, a big part of spreading the word about our program is, subscribe, is subscribing to Christian Questions in iTunes or Apple Podcasts or Google Podcasts, Stitcher, whatever your favorite podcast channel is, please rate us and review us. We'd greatly, greatly appreciate it. Coming up next week, has my Christianity been compromised? Has my Christianity been compromised? A lot to be said on that. So we'll talk to you next week. <laughs>